That was 14. We had, um, over the last couple of months, we've had um, seven here in the sanctuary. And then upstairs, Josh has had the rest of them. And uh, that's the way the Lord works. I'm so thankful for our youth department here at church. They do a wonderful job. Uh, Josh and Brittany work with these kids, and they do a wonderful job with them. On Wednesday night, it's um, you can go up there and see 30 to 35 kids upstairs. I don't know how all y'all crowd in that little room upstairs. How do you do that? That's a closeness. But anyway, we're thankful for the way the Lord has blessed our church. Well, let's all stand just a moment this morning. I'm not going to be long. I won't keep you but about an hour and a half, and you can go home. <laughs> and you know better than that. I want you to look in the book of Luke. The book of Luke, chapter 12. And actually, this morning, there's three stories, really, in this Luke, chapter 12. But I'm going to talk about one this morning and then one tonight. The one I'm going to talk about this morning is found in uh, verse 13 and 14. And so I'm just going to read, you'll have all the verses up there, but I'm just going to read uh, verse 13 and 14 this morning for time. And then I'm going to give you a little bit about what our message is going to be about. It says there in Luke chapter 12 verse 13 and 14, And one of the company said unto him, Master... Speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me judge or divider over you? Let's thank the Lord for the reading of his word. Father, we love you. We thank you this morning for your precious word. Lord, what a service. Holy Spirit, you are just so good. Thank you for what you're doing here this morning. Thank you for lives that have been changed, families that have been changed, the work that you're doing here in our church. Thank you, Father, for everything that you're going to do during the message today. In your precious, sweet name, we pray these things in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, turn around and tell somebody you love them, and if you see a visitor, thank them for being here. This first part of Luke chapter 12 that I read, verse 13 and 14, I want to kind of say this is the live portion of uh, Luke 12. And then tonight we will look at the parable portion of Luke chapter 12. In the live portion, of course, it is about a man who is interested in his inheritance, his money, his property. What's his? A lot of that's going on in our day and time. We're more interested in money and property and things that's ours than we are our spiritual life. And if I want to teach our young people and our young couples and our church anything, it is that God blesses us with the things of life, money and different things, but we can never make that our God, money. And it seems like that in our day and time, we have come to that portion that that's what we think about. I looked up some things that I think might be interesting to you this morning about this subject of inheritance and money and and property and things. In America, there's an estimated 10.8 million Americans with assets of more than $1 million. 
So right now, well, this uh, statistic was taken from 216. There's nothing this year, but 10.8 million Americans. Just 25 years ago, I did the same statistic, and there were fewer, much fewer than half that. Billionaires in America are multiplying even faster. In 1983, Forbes counted 13 Americans that were billionaires in 1983. But in the year 2016, there were more than 540 billionaires. Never before in history of this country has so much money been made so quickly by so many people. Now, it may not be wrong to want to be a millionaire, and it's not. But if that becomes your God, then it's very dangerous. And I warn these kids, because a lot of times that's what's pushed in us. That our worth is by what we have. What property we have, what money we have in the bank, how big our check is. But God says your soul matters much more than these things. I've seen a lot of warnings around me just during the daytime. I know if you get in your car and you don't put your seatbelt on, what happens? That thing starts dinging, doesn't it? It drives you crazy. There's a lot of warning signs around us. There is warning labels to tell us the side effects of certain medicines and certain things that we take. But when was the last time that you saw on a $100 bill a label that gave a warning for that $100 bill or that stock certificate or that bank deposit slip? See, we don't warn ourselves about this Because we don't read the Bible anymore, and the Bible is the one that warns us. Sometimes I think there should be a warning on our our way we think and the way we teach and the way we tell our kids that, that money and material things are the most important in life. And We may not do that just right out by telling them that, but we do that in our actions and we do that in the things that we teach them. Now, I'm not out of touch with people. I understand this. And I know a lot of times that people don't like to hear preaching like this or teaching like this. And I can tell you this. If I preached as much in the Bible that the Bible tells us about money, I probably would preach it about every other Sunday. I didn't know this till I looked it up, and this will be interesting to you all. Um, the Scripture uh, has these parables. As a matter of fact, there's 38 parables in God's Word. And did you know that 16 out of the 38 is about our relationship to money and material things? So God thought it was important, didn't he? Now, when we get down tonight to the parable of this certain rich man, we will see that the Lord calls him a fool. He calls him a fool because, not because he had money, but because money had him. And the Bible says about this man that he eventually died. And he died of the cancer of covetousness. To covet. And we learn from this man why truly this world is not enough. You can have all of this world and it's not enough when it comes down to you dying and leaving this world. Because by the way, what you have, you can't take with you. Never have, never will. I heard a joke one time about this woman that in the will... Her husband was very rich, uh, a millionaire back then, and he said that when I die, I want to take all my money, and I want you to put it in the casket with me. And she thought to herself, okay. So she wrote a check and signed it and put it in his casket for the money he had. (laughs) 
You'll get that in a minute. Money and the love of money. So this morning I'm going to give you two or three things and I want to let you go. I got ten minutes and I can do it. First of all, I want to talk about this worldliness and this materialism. And it's found there in verse 13 and 14. You've got to get the story. The story is that this man had a dispute with his brother over the inheritance of his father's estate. Now, the law said back then that the older brother uh, would get two-thirds of the estate and the younger brother would get one-third. So when you think about that, what happened with this man, he felt like he was not getting his legal share, so he appealed to Jesus for help in getting his share. Now that may sound unusual to you, but it really wasn't unusual because in biblical times, the teachers or the, uh, the priests were the ones that would uh, take over these financial disputes and try to get them uh, taken care of. So he felt like if he went with Jesus and went to Jesus, that Jesus would take care of this for him. So it was common for them to go to the teachers or the rabbis for these disputes. The first thing I want to talk about is this. When this man came to Jesus, the man was in the congregation listening to Jesus preach. Now you say, what do you mean? How do you know that? Well, there's a strong possibility that this man was even a follower of Jesus. Now I'm not talking about a saved man. I'm talking about that he just followed Jesus around. You know, we have a lot of those. We have a lot of people that are interested in certain things of the church, the music, the, uh, you know, the, the teaching certain classes, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the things they do, the, the ladies' groups and all this, and they're interested in those certain things, but they're no more interested in Jesus than a man in the moon. It's just a place for them to go. And we believe that's what this man was. It was just a place for him to go, a follower of Jesus. He went to hear him preach. Matter of fact, this is seen in that he had apparently passed, uh, 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 that he had paused, Jesus had, for a brief rest in between sermons. So he had preached one sermon, and now he was resting, and this guy came to him while he was resting. And he wanted to ask Jesus this question. The man knew him enough about Jesus to approach him because Jesus didn't turn him away. So the man, he must have seen him before. They must have been a little bit acquainted with each other. And he was in this huge crowd, so he came to Jesus. So this man was in the congregation listening to Jesus. We know that. A lot of people listen, but not a lot of us abide by what God says. The second thing is this morning, what the man wanted was significant. I mean, he wanted this dispute settled. It was significant. It was something that was uh, real. And a lot of times in our lives, we think because we think it's the most important thing, that God ought to think that it's the most important thing. But sometimes it's not that way. Sometimes it's not that way. Listen, Jesus knows you better than you know yourself. He can look down into your heart this morning and know if you know him. He knows. You can't fool him. This man couldn't fool Jesus. Even though what he had was significant, he wanted material wealth. He wanted money and property. He, he appealed to Jesus for help in getting what he probably was the right, his right to get. It was rightfully his property and his money. And it would have been an act of justice for Jesus to straighten it out, but he didn't see fit to do that. The third thing. Jesus refused him in a stern way. He 
Jesus forcefully addressed the man as a stranger. You know what he called him? He said, man. He didn't address him at his name. So that goes to show us there that he really wasn't of Jesus. Jesus addressed him as just a man. And when Jesus addressed him this way, he treats him as an alien to the things of the Lord and an alien to the purpose that Jesus had on this earth. And I'm here to ask you this morning, what do you think the purpose of Jesus is this morning in your life? Who are you supposed to be? What is God calling you to do? Because listen to me this morning, folks, if you are saved and you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot keep on being lazy. You've got to do something. You may sit back and use every excuse in the world about why you're the way you are. But I asked you, when you stand before God one day and give Him an account of your life, is that going to stand up in His court? It may stand up in my court, and it may stand up in your court, but is it going to stand up in His court? Because you will give an answer. So here was this man... And Jesus refused his request. He said, no. Has God ever refused you? Sure he has. There's things we ask sometimes, and we know when we ask them that God's not going to answer them. We know that it's the wrong thing to ask. Oh, we want to do this, and we want to do that. Lord, I think I need to do this, and I need to do that. And you know you're wrong when you asked it. And sometimes what gets us in trouble is when we go out of the answer of God and go on our own answer and do things, and then we get ourselves in trouble. There's a lot of Christians this morning that are in trouble because they're doing their own thing. They're doing their own thing. They're not doing what God wants them to do. Maybe that's you this morning. By the way, Jesus refused to become involved in worldly affairs. He didn't set property. He didn't give money. He didn't, he didn't you know, uh, take care of money disputes. That's not what he came for. In this, fourthly, the man exposed a serious flaw in his spiritual life. By the way, you will always expose yourself. If you're not really saved, you don't really know the Lord Jesus Christ, it will always come out. God will always show it. It will always come out somewhere. Because God exposes those flaws in our life. We know that Jesus had just preached a message before this in chapter 12. I want you to listen. Jesus had just just preached a message before this on trusting God for the necessities of life. Isn't that amazing? God had just preached to this man that was asking him questions after the, 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 the preaching on money. And Jesus had just preached on the necessities of life. What is really important? This old world today, when it comes to the things that are most important, probably 90% of the time, if you went out on the streets, most people would say, jobs and money. Not too many people anymore say Jesus. Jesus is important. And you're thinking about that right now, and you're thinking to yourself, what would I have answered? And you know I'm right on that. That Jesus is just not important to our lives anymore. He's not important to, uh, to our families anymore. And we see that in the things that are happening in our world today. We've pushed him out. And when we pushed him out, wickedness came in. And that's where we're at today. You say, well, that's just a, 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 just a brushing of the, uh, of the brush of that. You know, that's not all that it is. I'm here to tell you right now, that is what it is. When we push Jesus out of our schools, 
we have wickedness and shootings and murder and all these things in our schools. So he had just preached a message on the necessities of life. He said, God cares for you. God will provide for you. That was the message. But apparently this man did not hear anything Jesus had to say, as some of you this morning will not hear anything Jesus has to say. Because your heart and your mind is preoccupied with everything else. It's occupied with with life, with stress, with money problems, with with family problems. And that's the way the devil works. When are we ever going to get it? That it's the devil that does these things so that we can't hear from Jesus. I mean, used to be that we could come to church and we could pray together and say, Lord Jesus, we want you to come down and be with us this morning. And Lord, please put out all the things that would keep me from hearing from you. But you know what? We come to church now and we really don't want to hear from Jesus because we know if we hear from Jesus, we'll have to change our lives. This man had just heard Jesus preach on the necessities of life, that God would take care of him, God would provide, and he heard nothing because he was too preoccupied with the thought of property and money, and and he really didn't want to receive the message from Jesus. And some of you may be like that today. Oh, he listened to the words being preached. But there's a difference than listening and really hearing. A lot of people listen to you when you witness to them and when you tell them about Jesus and they agree with you and they know that you're right about a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, but that's not for them. And the thinking behind that is this. Everybody listen to me. The thinking behind that is this. I'll have another chance to get that thing right. So I'm not interested right now, but maybe later on. How do you know there's going to be a later on? There may not be a later on. And I'm going to tell you, just like Billy Graham would say, uh, you know, you, may, you don't have the promise of tomorrow. Today is it, right now, right in this moment. He didn't learn anything from the message. He didn't know anything about the Word. He didn't know anything about salvation. I'm going to tell you, a lot of people that don't make it, listen to me, young folks, a lot of people that don't make it when it comes to to their life with Christ are those people that really didn't get it. And there's a lot of those. They really don't get it. They came to church, heard the message, heard the music, felt the spirit, but they really didn't get it. Maybe you're one of those. This guy's mind was wondering about everything else except what Jesus was saying to him. Last but not least, look, I'm I'm done right here. Let's look at the contrast between the mind and attitude of the man and Jesus because it's significant. The man's mind was set on things of the earth, and that's all I'm telling you this morning. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Don't set your heart and mind on this earth. Because this earth is fading away, and so are you. There is nothing significant that you can take with you from this earth except your soul. Jesus talks about your soul, how important it is. I want to talk to you just for a moment about your soul, how important it is this morning. Your soul is worth more than 10 billion of these worlds. And I'm going to talk about someone that is the lover of your soul. You see, 
There's one that loves you more than anything else in this whole world. And he has everything. And his name's Jesus. He loves your soul. It doesn't matter where you're at this morning. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what kind of, uh, uh, of lifestyle that you're living right now. Listen to me. Look at me. Jesus loves you. And Jesus loves your soul. And here's what Jesus wants to do with your soul. He wants you because he gave you your soul. It's not yours. Jesus purchased it with a price. And we're going to talk about that next week. He purchased it with his precious blood because he loves your soul so much. He loves you so much this morning that right now, just like all of these, gave their heart to the Lord. All of these on this side gave their heart to the Lord. Listen, they could stand up and testify right now. When I said yes to Jesus, I know he lives in my heart. Am I right or wrong? He lives in your heart. Why? Because he said he would save you if you'd asked. And you may be here this morning and you've never asked Jesus to save you. Jesus loves your soul. And he will save you. Wouldn't it be good to walk out of here today and know that you're right with the Lord? And know that if, if you died today that you'd go to heaven to be with Jesus? Isn't it worth that? To give your heart to Jesus? He loves you. But just like this man, don't be just like this man. Be in the service. Hear the message, but have only one thing on your mind, and it's you. You see, all he had on his mind was what was going to help him, or what would take him to a different level. He didn't listen to Jesus and the message. And this morning, if you haven't heard anything else I said, the message is this. Jesus is interested in in you he's not interested in your money he's not interested in your property he's not inter interested in your stocks and bonds and all the things the gold and silver you have the thing he is interested in is your soul I'd rather have Jesus than anything that this old world affords wouldn't you Bow your head just a second. Lord Jesus, I love you. And I thank you because money and property is nothing without Jesus. God is not against people doing well for themselves, but he is against when the money and the property and the things become more important than him. Lord, I don't know who's here this morning that you're speaking to, but I know through the Holy Spirit you're speaking to somebody. And I pray right now that your Holy Spirit will touch the hearts of men and women, boys and girls, young couples, teenagers, and change us, Father. I'd rather have you. If you're here this morning and God is speaking to you and you've never been saved, you've never asked Jesus into your heart, but God is speaking to you this morning. You see, He has to be speaking to you. You can't get saved without the Holy Spirit. So if He's speaking to you this morning and you know that you need to be saved, I'm going to ask you to say this little prayer with me right now. Nobody's looking around. This is between you and God. You don't have to say it out loud. Say it to yourself. But if you want Jesus to save you this morning, I'm going to ask you to say this little prayer with me. You ready? Here we go. Lord Jesus. Say those words. Lord Jesus, I'm not saved. But I've heard the gospel this morning. And Lord, I want you to come into my heart. And I want you to save me because... I want to give my soul back to you. It's yours anyway. 
And Lord, I want you to use me in your work. And I want you to go with me everywhere I go. Say those words. Lord, I know you died on the cross for my sins. And because of your precious blood, say that. Because of your precious blood, you can wash my sins away today. Now here's the important part. Say these words with me. Lord Jesus, I accept you today as my personal Savior. Thank you for saving me. Keep your eyes closed. You may be here today and you're just, you know, you're a Christian, but you've not been a vibrant Christian. You're just kind of going, you know, rolling with the punches and, and nothing's really been, you know, you've just kind of been down and out and down in the mouth and all this stuff because you're just not happy and the Lord is speaking to you this morning conviction is on your heart because you've not been all that God wants you to be I want you to say this little prayer with me this morning nobody's looking this is between you and God if you want to repent of that and get back into what God wants you to do I want you to say this little prayer with me Lord Jesus I'm sorry go ahead say that Lord, I repent before you today, and I ask you to use me in the mighty way. I've been saved, and, and I want to get back on track with what you have for my life. And Lord, I love you with all my heart, and I thank you for convicting my soul today, and thank you for what you're going to do for me. Now listen, with every head bowed, every eye closed, we've got to hurry. If you prayed that first prayer this morning, nobody's looking around, it's between me, you, and God. If you prayed that first prayer this morning, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be proud of what God has done in your heart. And I want you to stand to your feet right now. If you prayed and asked Jesus to save you this morning, amen. Keep standing just a second. Anybody else, I prayed and asked Jesus to save me this morning. Right quick, right quick. We're not going to linger. Anybody else? Amen. Anybody else? Right quick, I prayed and asked Jesus to save me. Amen. Amen. Keep standing for just a second. Anybody else? Right quick, and then we're going to quit. Anybody else? Right quick. Look at me, sis. In the back, look at me just a moment. Do you mean that? I'm proud of you. I love you. You sat down. Sis, over here, did you mean that? You meant what you did this morning? God bless you. Amen. You can be seated. Now, if you said that second prayer this morning and you asked Jesus to forgive you, you're a Christian, but you just want to be more than what you are, I'm going to ask you to stand right now real quick. You said that, amen, anybody else, amen, keep on standing, amen, 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 anybody else right quick, amen, keep standing just a second, right quick, amen, anybody else, you asked Jesus, you know you're a Christian, but you've just not been living like you should, right quick, everybody look at me and stand, do you mean that, do you mean it? Do you mean it? Me. How about you? Do you mean it, sis? Man, I am so proud of you. Let's give God a hand. You can be seated. We had a bunch stand today that they're Christian and they want God to use them. And I make you stand because you ought to do it openly and publicly. You ought to be proud of what you've done. Had two young ladies get saved today. Amen. Amen.